Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Pleaden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And this means that I specialize in helping connect you with your angels. Angels are non-denominational divine messengers that are filled with divine love for you and for us all. And connecting with them has been one of the great joys of my life. And so I knew when I created this podcast that of course the angels would be here with us. So if you would like to more deeply explore your connection with the angels, I offer one-on-one sessions as well as soul mentoring, which supports you as you move through a time of transformation or growth or healing. And then I also offer a wide variety of classes that will inspire your spirit. And you can learn more at my website, illuminatingsouls.com. And this podcast was born out of my deep love for sleep podcasts. I started listening to them several years ago, and I don't remember exactly how or why I started listening. I'm not someone who had listened to a lot of podcasts, but there were one or two that had spoken to my heart. And at one point, I think I must have been looking over the charts on the Apple Podcast app, and I saw a podcast called Sleep With Me, which is a rather intriguing title, yes? (laughs) And as I went on to read about it, it said that it was a podcast designed to help you fall asleep. And I I had no idea how that would work. I didn't know if it was going to be a meditation or what it was going to be. And the podcast is simply wonderful. If you're looking for another podcast to add to your sleep repertoire, it is a beautiful podcast produced by Andrew Ackerman. I believe he must have started it in 2013 or 2014. He's done over a thousand episodes and he has different types of episodes that he does. And I was absolutely enchanted with it. And it really became a huge part of my self-care. And every week I would log in to see what the new episodes would be. And there were certain kinds of episodes that were my favorite. And what I discovered is I built a deep inner intimacy with his podcast. He felt like a friend, and many of his episodes felt like conversations I might have with a friend, and they brought me tremendous comfort and helped me sleep. And then, I don't know, maybe about a year and a half ago or two years ago, I discovered a whole treasure trove of sleep podcasts, each that had a little bit of a different take on the genre. Some of them that I fell in love with read books that were in public domain, like Little Women, Pride and Prejudice, Jane Eyre. Others wrote 
stories designed to take you into just a sweet adventure. And I fell in love with all of them. I I just thought there was something really magical in this genre and I wanted more. I, I'm I'm a I'm a binger, <laughs> meaning when I love something, I want more of it. And so I would look at all the different sleep podcasts, and then I started to feel the spark of inspiration. You know, maybe I could do a sleep podcast. And it was last fall that the inspiration crystallized. And at first, I so funny, I was not going to include the angels. I really just wanted this to be exclusively all about sleep, and I was going to read stories. And then, of course, the angels have to be a part of it, right? How could I bring something to my Illuminating Souls family that didn't include the angels? <laughs> and so we're coming up on the one-year anniversary of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, and It has been such a joy to grow this podcast with you because over time, the vibe and the rhythm and the content of this podcast has revealed itself. It's what I love about a wandering journey. It reveals itself with every step. It's like I'm not one to plan far ahead. I much prefer the art of wandering to see what is to be discovered rather than foisting my agenda onto an act of creation. And I absolutely love creating this podcast for you. And for me too, I receive a lot of sleepy experiences with my own podcast. So so if you're listening for the first time or you're new to this concept of a sleep podcast, it's designed to keep you company as you fall off to sleep. It's not meant to be something where you focus and try to keep track of everything I'm saying. It's really designed to be a rambling, loving, kind inspiring conversation that keeps your mind distracted while you fall off to sleep. So if you're someone who has a hard time shutting your mind off to drift off to sleep, a podcast like this can really help. And it may take a few tries. It might not work the first night. But over time, my experience at least has been, you build a relationship with it and it builds a relationship with you. And then it becomes a gateway to sleep. And I will also acknowledge that I know that many of you listen during your waking hours on purpose. You don't want to go to sleep, but you enjoy the vibe and the stories that I share. And so if you're using this during your waking hours, it is a joy to have you here also. So however you use this podcast, it truly is an honor and a blessing to get to spend this time with you. So one of the things I was contemplating as I get ready to record this episode is I am going through a pocket of stillness in my life right now. And it's interesting because I am coming off several weeks of things being very, very busy. I'm sorry, there's cars in the background. I don't know what is going on, but the the car noise in my neighborhood is very um, apparent right now. So it should stop in a little bit. So the stillness I was talking about, which is not being reflected by the traffic in my neighborhood, it shows up in this experience of not knowing what I'm supposed to do next. 
So what, what classes I should offer, what project to put my energy into. I love to create through sparks of inspiration and soul whispers where something speaks to me and it almost comes with its own battery pack and I feel engaged and inspired and I know where I'm going or at least I know where I'm going for a little while. These last two to two and a half weeks, I have just been sitting and waiting for the inspiration to find me. And that's not my most comfortable space because I wonder, is my inspiration going to come back? Which I know it will. <laughs> um, I wonder if everybody else is inspired and I'm the only one sitting in quiet contemplation. That's often how my consciousness works. I think all of you out there are feeling inspired and on purpose, and I am the only one sitting in the quiet, which typically is not true. There's this beautiful card from the Osho Zen Tarot deck, and it is the No Thingness card. So it's spelled like nothingness, but there's a hyphen between no and thingness. So it's the no thingness card. And the card is all black. So at first it might seem ominous, but it's not. It talks about that space of stillness between breaths or that pause just before a new universe is created. And so in some ways I feel like I am in a pocket of no thingness right now. And over the years, I've done my best to learn to be comfortable in it, but it's not easy. But I am in the no thingness. It feels sweet. It feels comforting. And I feel the angels coming in saying, just breathe and rest and be present because the waves of energy will be flowing for you very soon. So I do my best to trust these pockets of stillness or no thingness as best I can. And I thought I would mention it in case you are experiencing this as well. It's interesting. I live a very inspired life. I don't mean that everything is bright and shiny all the time, but I have learned to navigate based on the winds of inspiration. I learn to follow what speaks to me, what whispers to me. It's one of the reasons why if you're on my mailing list, you may notice I don't have long launches for my classes. I typically might only give 10 days or two weeks notice, sometimes only five days before a new class starts because I get the download and the energy is so vibrant. It's like the angels say, go now, it's time. (laughs) And then several of you sign up and we have a wonderful adventure So I don't have these strategies for long launches. I don't know what I will be offering in January. I wait and I listen. I sometimes remember um, the show, The Flying Nun. I don't know how many of you remember it. It was a show with Sally Field and she played a nun and the nuns had to wear these habits that had this odd origami-shaped headdress. 
And the premise of the show was Sally Field, for some reason, was aerodynamically able to fly when she had her habit on. (laughs) It was a very silly show, but delightful. And she would lick her finger and hold it up to the wind to feel which way the wind was blowing. And I feel like that's how I co-create the flying nun philosophy of co-creation. But you know, sometimes there's no breeze yet. Yet. Yet being the the um, operative word. The breeze isn't gone forever. It's just a pause between breaths. It's like, hang in there. Just hang in. It's coming for you, I promise. So if you are in the stillness or a place of no thingness, perhaps we can hang out and have some hot cocoa together and ramble and share the stories of our lives while we wait for the next wave of inspiration to find us. Because it will, it always does, I promise. And so I'll tell you what, I'll call the angels in and ask that they bring us waves of inspiration that speak to our hearts. So you get comfortable if you're not already cozied up and take some deep breaths in and out, allowing your body to rest and relax pulling your blankets up just so. It's cooler weather here where I live and I have been able to add on two more blankets, which makes me so happy. So arranging my blankets as I go to sleep makes me so delighted. So however your blankets work for you, just pull them up just right. And I will call in the angels So beautiful angels on high, I know you are already here. I feel the waves of love you are bringing forward for each one of our beloveds here. I welcome you here, and as I say these words, I feel you welcoming each of us into this beautiful sanctuary of light. And angels, I ask that you bring blessings of love, of healing, of compassion, and of understanding to each of our beloveds who is listening to this message. Angels, please help each of us navigate our paths with even more grace, sprinkling sparks of goodness and inspiration upon our path. And dear ones, just take some nice deep breaths in and out. Just breathing in the goodness and the love that is here for you. The angels invite you to just breathe and be present. And they are infusing you with divine light that will help to bring healing to all aspects of your beingness. This love is flowing to you gently. The angels are helping you on your own divine, unique path here on the planet. You are precious in this world. You are a gift from on high. And we are so deeply grateful for you. 
and you have done enough for this day. And you have permission to drift off into a good expanse of rest. And as you do, you can just listen to my voice and to the words that I share with you and the story I will tell you. I promise not to share something so important that you have to pay attention. And just breathe and breathe in the love and the light and the goodness that is here for you. And while you drift off, your angels will be with you. And I'm going to read you a story. So for this episode, I'm guided to return us to the pages of the book, The Mountains of California by John Muir. I purchased this book about a month ago while my husband and I were in Utah. He was there for a business trip. And we wandered through some old bookstores, used bookstores. And I found a copy of this book. It was originally published in 1894. And I have a huge love affair with the mountains of California. When I first moved here in 1985, I was enchanted by the wide variety of expressions of nature here in California. We have old growth forests and we have mountain ranges and we have oceans and meadows and so much more. And so I thought I would bring us back and I would read to you some more of his reflections of his experience of California in the 1800s. So this is chapter two, the glaciers. And I will acknowledge that those of you in the UK and perhaps in Australia would say glaciers. We say glaciers here in the US. Of the small residual glaciers mentioned in the preceding chapter, I have found 65. They occur singly or in small groups on the north sides of the peaks of the high Sierra, sheltered beneath broad frosty shadows, in amphitheaters of their own making, where the snow shooting down from the surrounding heights and avalanches is most abundant. Over two-thirds of the entire number lie between latitude 37 degrees and 38 degrees and form the highest fountains of the San Joaquin, Merced, Tuolumne, and Owens Rivers. The glaciers of Switzerland, like those of the Sierra, are mere wasting remnants of the mighty ice floods that once filled the great valleys and poured into the sea. So are those also of Norway, Asia, and South America. Even the grand continuous mantles of ice that still cover Greenland, Spitsbergen, Nova Zembla, Franz Joseph Land, parts of Alaska, and the South Polar region are shallowing and shrinking. Every glacier in the world is smaller than it once was. All the world is growing warmer, or the crop of snow flowers is diminishing. But in contemplating the condition of the glaciers of the world, we must bear in mind while trying to account for the changes going on that the same sunshine that wastes them builds them. Every glacier records the expenditure of an enormous amount of sun heat in lifting the vapor for the snow of which it is made is from the ocean to the mountains, as Tyndall strikingly shows. 
the number of glaciers in the Alps is 1,100, of which 100 may be regarded as primary, and the total area of ice snow is estimated at 1,177 square miles, or an average for each glacier of little more than one square mile. On the same authority, the average height above sea level at which they melt is about 7,414 feet. The Grindelwald Glacier descends below 4,000 feet and one of the Mont Blanc glaciers reaches nearly as low a point. One of the largest of the Himalaya glaciers on the headwaters of the Ganges does not, according to Captain Hodgson, descend below 12,914 feet. The largest of the Sierra glaciers on Mount Shasta descends to within 9,500 feet of the level of the sea, to which, as far as I have observed, is the lowest point reached by any glacier within the bounds of California, the average height of all being not far from 11,000 feet. And I'm just going to interject that it would be interesting to see what that is now, all these years later. But since it's a sleep podcast and not a science podcast, I'm going to continue reading from this snapshot of the 1800s. The changes that have taken place in the glacial conditions of the Sierra from the time of the greatest extension is well illustrated by the series of glaciers of every size and form extending along the mountains of the coast to Alaska. A general exploration of this instructive region shows that to the north of California through Oregon and Washington, groups of active glaciers still exist on all the high volcanic cones of the Cascade Range, Mount Pitt, the Three Sisters, Mount Jefferson, Hood, St. Helens, Adams, Rainier, Baker, and others, some of them of considerable size, although none of them approach the sea. Of these mountains, Rainier in Washington is the highest and iciest. Its dome-like summit between 14,000 and 15,000 feet high is capped with ice, and eight glaciers, seven to twelve miles long, radiate from it as a center and form the sources of the principal streams of the state. The lowest descending of this fine group flows through beautiful forests to within 3,500 feet of the sea level and sends forth a river laden with glacier, mud, and sand. On through British Columbia and southeastern Alaska, the broad, sustained mountain chain extending along the coast is generally glacier-bearing. The upper branches of nearly all the main canyons and fords are occupied by glaciers which gradually increase in size and descend lower until the high region between Mount Fairweather and Mount St. Elias is reached, where a considerable number discharge into the waters of the ocean. This is preeminently the ice land of Alaska and of the entire Pacific coast. Northward from here, the glaciers gradually diminish in size and thickness and melt at higher levels. In Prince William Sound and Cook's Inlet, many fine glaciers are displayed, pouring from the surrounding mountains, but to the north of a latitude 62 degrees few, if any glaciers remain, the ground being mostly low in the snowfall light. Between a latitude of 56 degrees and 60 degrees, there are probably more than 5,000 glaciers, not counting the smallest. Hundreds of the largest size descend through the forest to the level of the sea or near it, through as far as my own observations have reached, after a pretty thorough examination of the region, not more than 25 discharge icebergs into the sea. All the long high-walled fords into which these great glaciers of the first class flow 
are, of course, crowded with icebergs of every conceivable form, which are detached with thundering noise at intervals of a few minutes from an imposing ice wall that is thrust forward into deep water. But these Pacific Coast icebergs are small as compared to those of Greenland in the Antarctic region, and only a few of them escape from the intricate systems of channels with which this portion of the coast is fringed into the open sea. Nearly all of them are swashed and drifted by wind and tide back and forth until finally melted by the ocean water, the sunshine, the warm winds, and the copious rains of summer. Only one glacier on the coast observed by Professor Russell discharges its bergs directly into the open sea at Icy Cape opposite Mount St. Elias. And then there are several more pages to that chapter, but I'm going to skip ahead and change it up a little bit and come to chapter three where he's talking about the snow. The first snow that whitens the Sierra usually falls about the end of October or early in November to a depth of a few inches after months of the most charming Indian summer weather imaginable. But in a few days, this light covering mostly melts from the slopes exposed to the sun and causes but little apprehension on the part of mountaineers who may be lingering among the high peaks at this time. The first general winter storm that yields snow that is to form a lasting portion of the season's supply seldom breaks on the mountains before the end of November. Then, warned by the sky, cautious mountaineers together with the wild sheep, deer, and most of the birds and bears make haste to the lowlands or foothills, and burrowing marmots, mountain beavers, wood rats, and such people go into winter quarters, some of them not again to see the light of day until the general awakening and resurrection of the spring in June or July. The first heavy fall is usually from about two to four feet in depth, Then, with intervals of splendid sunshine, storm succeeds storm, heaping snow upon snow, until thirty to fifty feet has fallen. But on the account of its settling and compacting, and the almost constant waste from melting and evaporation, the average depth actually found at any time seldom exceeds ten feet in the forest region, or 15 feet along the slopes of the summit peaks. Even during the coldest weather, evaporation never wholly ceases, and the sunshine that abounds between the storms is sufficiently powerful to melt the surface more or less through all the winter months. Waste from the melting also goes on to some extent on the bottom from the heat stored up in the rocks, and given off slowly to the snow in contact with them, as is shown by the rising of the streams on all of the higher regions after the first snowfall and their steady sustained flow all winter. The greater portion of the snow deposited around the lofty summits of the range falls into small crisp flakes and broken crystals, or when accompanied by strong winds and low temperatures, the crystals, instead of being locked together in their fall to form tufted flakes, are beaten and broken into meal and fine dust. But down in the forest region, the greater portion comes gently to the ground, light and feathery, some of the flakes in mild weather being nearly an inch in diameter and it is evenly distributed and kept from drifting to any great extent by the shelter afforded by the large trees. Every tree during the progress of gentle storms is loaded with fairy bloom at the coldest and darkest time of year, bending the branches and hushing every single needle. But as soon as the storm is over and the sun shines, the snow at once begins to shift and settle 
and fall from the branches and miniature avalanches, and the white forest soon becomes green again. The snow on the ground also settles and thaws every bright day and freezes at night until it becomes coarsely granulated and loses every trace of its rayed crystalline structure, and then a man may walk firmly over its frozen surface as if on ice. The forest region up to an elevation of 7,000 feet is usually in great part free from snow in June, but at this time the higher regions are still heavy laden and are not touched by spring weather to any considerable extent before the middle or end of July. One of the most striking effects of the snow on the mountain is the burial of the rivers and small lakes. The first snowflakes that fall into the Sierra rivers vanish thus suddenly, but in great storms when the temperature is low, the abundance of the snow at length chills the water nearly to the freezing point, and then, of course, it ceases to melt and consume the snow so suddenly. The falling flakes and crystals form cloud-like masses of blue sludge which are swept forward with the current and carried down to warmer climates many miles distant, while some are lodged against logs and rocks and projecting points of the banks and last for days, piled high above the level of the water, and show white again, instead of being at once lost forever while the rivers themselves are at length lost for months during the snowy period. The snow is first built out from the banks in bossy, over-curling drifts, compacting and cementing until the streams are spanned. They then flow in the dark beneath a continuous covering across the snowy zone, which is about 30 miles wide. All the Sierra rivers and their tributaries in these high regions are thus lost every winter, as if another glacial period had come on. Not a drop of running water is to be seen excepting at a few points where large falls occur, through a rush and rumble of the heavier currents may still be heard. Toward spring, when the weather is warm during the day and frosty at night, Repeated thawing and freezing, and new layers of snow render the bridging masses dense and firm, so that one may safely walk across the streams, or even lead a horse across them without danger of falling through. In June, the thinnest parts of the winter ceiling, and the most exposed to sunshine, begin to give way, forming dark, rugged, edged, pit-like sinks, at the bottom of which rushing water may be seen. At the end of June, only here and there, may the mountaineer find a secure snow bridge. The most lasting of the winter bridges, thawing from below as well as from above, because of warm currents of air passing through the tunnels, are strikingly arched and sculptured, and by the occasional freezing of the oozing, dripping water of the ceiling, they become brightly and picturesquely icy. In some of the reaches, where there is a free margin, we may walk through them, small skylights appearing here and there. These tunnels are not very dark. The roaring river fills all the arching way with impressively loud reverberating music which is sweetened at time by the oozel, a bird that is not afraid to go wherever a stream may go, and to sing wherever a stream sings. All the small alpine pools and lakelets are in like manner obliterated from the winter landscapes, either by being first frozen and then covered by snow, or by being filled in by avalanches. The first avalanche of the season shot into a lake basin may perhaps find the surface frozen. Then there is a grand crashing of breaking ice and dashing of waves mingled with the low, deep booming of the avalanche. D. 
Detached masses of the invading snow mixed with fragments of ice drift about in sludgy island-like heaps, while the main body of it forms a talus with its base wholly or in part resting on the bottom of the basin as controlled by its depth and size of the avalanche. The next avalanche, of course, encroaches still farther and so on with each in succession until the entire basin may be filled and its water sponged up or displaced. This huge mass of sludge more or less mixed with sand, stones, and perhaps timber is frozen to a considerable depth and much sun heat is required to thaw it. Some of these unfortunate lakelets are not clear of ice and snow until near the end of summer. Others are never quite free, opening only on the side opposite the entrance of the avalanches. Some show only a narrow crescent of water lying between the shore and sheer bluffs of icy compacted snow, masses of which breaking off float in front like icebergs in a miniature Arctic ocean, while the avalanche heaps leaning back against the mountains look like small glaciers. The frontal cliffs are in some instances quite picturesque, and with the berg-dotted waters in front of them, lighted with sunshine, are exceedingly beautiful. It often happens that while one side of a lake basin is hopelessly snow-buried and frozen, the other enjoying sunshine is adorned with beautiful flower gardens. Some of the smaller lakes are extinguished in an instant by a heavy avalanche, either of rocks or snow, the rolling, sliding, ponderous mass entering on one side sweeps across the bottom and up the opposite side, displacing the water and even scraping the basin clean and shoving the accumulated rocks and sediments up the further bank and taking full possession. The dislodged water is in part absorbed, but most of it is sent around the front of the avalanche and down the channel of the outlet, roaring and hurrying as if frightened and glad to escape. Then he writes about snow banners. The most magnificent storm phenomenon I ever saw, surpassing in showy grandeur the most imposing effects of clouds, floods, or avalanches, was the peaks of the high Sierra back of the Yosemite Valley, decorated with snow banners. Many of the starry snow flowers out of which these banners are made fall before they are ripe, while most of those that do attain perfect development as six-rayed crystals glint and chafe against one another in their fall through the frosty air and are broken into fragments. This dry, fragmentary snow is still further prepared for the formation of banners by the action of the wind. For, instead of finding rest at once like the snow which falls into the tranquil depths of the forest, it is rolled over and over, beaten against rock ridges and swirled in pits and hollows, like boulders, pebbles, and sand in the potholes of a river, until finally the delicate angles of the crystals are worn off and the whole mass is reduced to dust. And whenever storm winds find this prepared snow dust in loose condition on exposed slopes, where there's a free upward sweep to leeward, it is tossed back into the sky and borne onward from peak to peak in the form of banners or cloudy drifts, according to the velocity of the wind and the conformation of the slopes up or around which it is driven. While thus flying through the air, a small portion makes good its, its escape and remains in the sky as vapor, 
but a far greater part after being driven into the sky again and again is at length locked fast in bossy drifts or in the wombs of glaciers, some of it to remain silent and rigid for centuries before it is finally melted and sent singing down the mountainsides to the sea. Yet, notwithstanding the abundance of winter snow dust in the mountains, and the frequency of high winds, and the length of time the dust remains loose and exposed to their action, the occurrence of well-formed banners is, for causes we shall hereafter note, comparatively rare. I have seen only one display of this kind that seemed in every way perfect, This was in the winter of 1873 when the snow-laden summits were swept by a wild norther. I happened at the time to be wintering in Yosemite Valley, that sublime Sierra temple where every day one may see the grandest sights. Yet even here the wild gala day of the north wind seemed surpassingly glorious. I was awakened in the morning by the rocking of my cabin and the beating of pine burrs on the roof. Detached torrents and avalanches from the main wind flood overhead were rushing wildly down the narrow side canyons and over the precipitous walls, with loud resounding roar rousing the pines to enthusiastic action and making the whole valley vibrate as though it were an instrument being played. But afar on the lofty exposed peaks of the range, standing so high in the sky, the storm was expressing itself in still grander characters, which I was soon to see in all their glory. I had long been anxious to study some points in the structure of the ice cone, that is formed every winter at the foot of the upper Yosemite Fall, but the blinding spray by which it is invested had hitherto prevented me from making a sufficiently near approach. This morning the entire body of the fall was torn into gauzy shreds and blown horizontally along the face of the cliff, leaving the cone dry and while making my way to the top of an overlooking ledge to see so favorable an opportunity to examine the interior of the cone, the peaks of the Merced group came into sight over the shoulder of the South Dome, each waving a resplendent banner against the blue sky as regular in form and in firm in texture as if woven of fine silk. So rare and splendid a phenomenon, of course, overbore all other considerations, and I at once let the ice cone go and began to force my way out of the valley to some dome or ridge sufficiently lofty to command a general view of the main summits, feeling assured that I should find them bannered still more gloriously nor was I in the least disappointed. Indian Canyon, through which I climbed, was choked with snow that had been shot down in avalanches from the high cliffs on either side, rendering the ascent difficult, but inspired by the roaring storm, the tedious wallowing brought no fatigue, and in four hours I gained the top of a ridge above the valley, 8,000 feet high, and there in bold relief like a clear painting appeared a most imposing scene. Innumerable peaks, black and sharp, rose grandly into the dark blue sky, their bases set in solid white, their sides streaked and splashed with snow like ocean rocks with foam, and from every summit all free and unconfused was streaming a beautiful silky slivery banner from half a mile to a mile in length, slender at the point of attachment and widening gradually as it extended from the peak until it was about a thousand or fifteen hundred feet in breadth, as near as I could estimate. 
the clusters of peaks called the Crown of the Sierra at the head of the Merced and Tuolumne Rivers, Mount Dana, Gibbs, Caness, or Conness, Lyle, McClure, Ritter, with their nameless compeers, each had its own refulgent banner waving with a clearly visible motion in the sun glow, and there was not a single cloud in the sky to mar their simple grandeur. Fancy yourself standing on this Yosemite ridge looking eastward. You notice a strange garish glitter in the air. The gale drives widely overhead with a fierce tempestuous roar, but its violence is not felt for you are looking through a sheltered opening in the woods as through a window. There in the immediate foreground of your picture rises a majestic forest of silver fir blooming in eternal freshness. The foliage yellow-green and the snow beneath the trees strewn with their beautiful plumes plucked off by the wind. Beyond and extending over all the middle ground are somber swaths of pine interrupted by huge swelling ridges and domes, and just beyond the dark forest you see the monarchs of the High Sierra waving their magnificent banners. They are twenty miles away, but you would not wish them nearer, for every feature is distinct, and the whole glorious show is seen in its right proportions. After this general view, mark how sharply the dark, snowless ribs and buttresses and summits of the peaks are defined, excepting the portions veiled by the banners and how delicately their sides are streaked with snow where it has come to rest in narrow flutings and gorges. Mark, too, how grandly the banners wave as the wind is deflected against their sides, and how trimly each is attached to the very summit of its peak, like a streamer at a masthead, how smooth and silky they are in texture, and how finely their fading fringes are penciled on the azure sky. See how dense and opaque they are at the point of attachment, and how filmy and translucent towards the end, so that the peaks back them as they are seen dimly as though you are looking through ground glass. Yet again, observe how some of the longest belonging to the loftiest summits stream perfectly free all the way across intervening notches and passes from peak to peak, while others overlap and partly hide each other. And consider how keenly every particle of this wondrous cloth of snow is flashing out jets of light. These are the main features of the beautiful and terrible picture as seen from the forest window and it would still be surpassingly glorious were at the fore and middle grounds obliterated together, leaving only the black peaks, the white banners, and the blue sky. Glancing now in a general direction at the formation of the snow banners, we find that the main causes of the wondrous beauty and perfection of those we have been contemplating were the favorable direction and great force of the wind the abundance of snow dust and the peculiar conformation of the slopes of the peaks. It is essential not only that the wind should move with great velocity and steadiness to supply a sufficiently copious and continuous stream of snow dust, but that it should come from the north. No perfect banner is ever hung on the Sierra peaks by a south wind. Had the gale that day blown from the south, leaving other conditions unchanged, only a dull, confused, fog-like drift would have been produced, for the snow, instead of being spouted up over the tops of the peaks in concentrated currents to be drawn out as streamers, would have been shut off around the sides and piled down into the glacier wombs. The cause of the concentrated action of the north wind is found in the peculiar form of the north sides of the peaks, 
where the amphitheaters of the residual glaciers are. In general, the south sides are convex and irregular, while the north sides are concave both in their vertical and horizontal sections. The wind in ascending these curves converges towards the summits, carrying the snow and concentrating currents with it, shooting it almost straight up into the air above the peaks from which it is then carried away in a horizontal direction. Isn't that a remarkable reflection of his experience of the snow banners? I've never heard that before. I'll have to go Google and see if I can find any pictures or more information about that. But my beautiful friends, we're going to complete out this chapter now. And I wish you the sweetest of dreams. And I am so deeply grateful for the gift of you. So I wish you a good rest. I wish you peace. I wish you love. And I look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank you.